If you have your Bibles with you tonight, open them up to uh, Mark chapter 15. Let me know when you get there. I'm just kidding. We're going to first Peter. We're going to second Peter. That is where we will be. Just gonna let you guys start thumbing through your Bible for a minute. It'll be alright. We might get back there. <clears throat> second Peter. We're actually going to take off right on the heels of where we left off this morning. Second Peter, and in chapter 1, says this, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them have obtained like precious faith, with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and into temperance patience, and into patience godliness, and into godliness brotherly kindness, and into brotherly kindness charity. For all these things be in you and abound, that they make you, that ye shall neither be barren, nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before your throne of grace again here this evening, Father, again, Lord, we're just thankful for the opportunity to be here. Father, we're thankful for each and every one who's come out to take part in your service here tonight. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you could just enter into the to the service with us. Father, we just ask you, Lord, that you could bless your word, Father, the reading thereof. Father, we just ask you, Lord, that you could just uh, fill this house, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, Father, to, just, to interpret to our hearts each and every one of us, Lord, the things that you would have us to to, to, to gather and to gain from this uh, passage here tonight, Lord. I ask you, Father, that you could just stand with me, Father, and help me to preach the word exactly the way you'd have it preached, Father, so that it would be your words coming forth and not my own. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you could be with our church, Father, the, the, the congregation. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you could bless them, Father, be with each and every prayer request that's been mentioned here tonight. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you could deal with each one according to your will. Father, we pray, Lord, for our nation, Lord, and our, uh, the, the shape and the situation in which we are in, Father, as we, uh, our, 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 our freedom, Father, is slowly being pulled from us. Father, we just ask you, Lord, that you could intervene, Father, in a divine way, Father, just to, to, to send a revival across our nation, Father, and let it, let it begin here tonight, Father, let our revival begin in the hearts of each one of the believers each one of your children. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you could be with each and every one of us. Father, just uh, lead, guide, and direct us. Father, we ask all these things in your Son, Christ Jesus' name, and amen. As we, as we get into this here, uh, the, the, the salutation here says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. Uh, as, as we get into looking at this, uh, uh, Peter uh, is, is saying that... Uh, 
He's not just saying that he is an apostle of Jesus. He's saying that he is the servant thereof. And he begins uh, saying that he is the servant first. And that is uh, uh, unique. And uh, the reason why that is unique, because uh, uh, each and every one of us need to understand that uh, before we are, uh, before we're pastor, before we're, before we're Sunday school teacher, song leader, uh, uh, director of whatever you may be director of or whatever it is that, it, that you are, I need you to know that you're a servant first and the servant is first and foremost. It says Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have uh, obtained like or uh, the similar uh, um, what do you say here the like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ and what uh, it, I, I like the way Peter says this because what he is saying is uh, uh, he, he's, he's starting off saying that he is the, that he is the servant uh, he's, he's also an apostle but he puts it second but he's saying that he's a servant but he's also saying that he's no better than any, each, any of the rest of them in which he's writing to because he, he likens himself to them he's saying that they're all the same he's saying that, the, and, uh, that he's done nothing special through what he's done but what he is saying is he's giving God all the glory of it, and he's saying that the only good that is in him is through Jesus. Uh, I like the way he says it, and he says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. We learned this morning that God didn't call us unto anything other than joy and triumph and victory. That, that is what God called us unto, and he said, his grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Multiplied. What does multiplied mean? Gets bigger, right? Right? Uh, it means that it's going to it, that it's going to multiply. It means it's going to get bigger. And th this grace and peace, if you want that multiplied in your life, if you finish reading uh, what it says, it says through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The only way that we're going to gain knowledge is by by doing our due diligence and in, in listening and the studying of the Word uh, and the the. Uh, it's not so much just listening and the studying of this Word, but listening uh, to what God actually has to say to us. Amen. Amen? If God ain't speaking to you, that's a whole other issue that we're going to have to cover. Tonight we're looking uh, at those that uh, have obtained like precious faith. And just uh, to, to reiterate, how is it that, 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 that you do that? How is it that you obtain your faith? By hearing the Word of God. Reading, by studying. By confessing your sins, admitting that, that, you, that, that you're a sinner, admitting that, th that you have done wrong in your life, putting your faith in, in, in God and in Jesus, that God sent his son to be born of a virgin and to die on a cross for you and I, and not only that, but that he, that he died upon that cross and he was buried and he was raised again the third day. It's faith in all those things. Like precious faith. How precious is that faith? It's another unique word that is in there. If you have a pen, underline the word precious. There's nothing more precious in your life than you're going to find than your faith in Jesus. But it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him... Anybody catch what was just stated right there? God has provided every single thing, every aspect of what we need to be godly, to be good uh, Christian people, to be good church members, to be good parents, to be good friends, to be good, good spouses. God has provided everything that we need according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life. Not only to, to our godly side of life, but he gives us all things that we need for life in general. That, that comes into your clothes, comes into your food, comes into shoes, uh, uh, transportation, so on and so forth. God has pr uh, provided all of this by his divine power. Let's go on. Let, let's keep moving. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory... Ain't, ain't, ain't you glad to know you was called into glory? Now seriously, you can be called into a lot of things, and a lot of things you can be called into is not a glorious profession, but knowing that you was called into the, to the fold, to call, be called into the, the, the family of God, knowing that you was called into glory, that's something to be looking forward to, amen? Anybody have a glorious job? 
Because when I get called to work tomorrow, there's going to be nothing glorious about it. I don't know what you folks, I don't know what all of you do for a living, but I'd be willing to bet that not everybody has a glorious job. You don't have a glorious purpose. I know when I work law enforcement, it was nothing glorious that we done. We was the most hated people in Livingston. There's nothing glorious about it. But knowing that I was called into the family, into the fold of God to, to, to have glory, to be a part of glory and virtue. You may know what virtue truly is. Moral excellence. We can use moral excellence for virtue. As Christian people, we should be moral people. Amen? Amen. All these things being said, if we was called into glory and virtue, we should definitely know the, the, the difference in right and wrong. Our, our morals should be uh, uh, a, a top priority in our daily lives. Now we can look at our nation and we can look at all this uh, in, in a, what we can do the umbrella effect here as it looks like we're going to need an umbrella when we leave. But if you use the umbrella effect to cover everything, we know it's morally wrong to kill a baby. Amen. We know that it is morally wrong for a man and a man to get married. We know it's morally wrong for a woman and a woman to get married. We know it's morally wrong just to shoot somebody for no good reason just for walking down the street. We know it's morally wrong to take something from, from someone else without asking. It's called stealing. We know it's morally wrong to do all these things, right? Let's get personal for a minute. Does your voting record reflect that? If we, are to be, if we are to have moral excellence, should we not associate with those that are morally excellent? Or at least attempt to practice moral excellence? Does the Bible not teach us to be, uh, to, not to be unequally yoked? Are you the only person in your, 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 your circle of friends who thinks this way? Are you the only person around that whenever they're talking about this, that you're the, you're the odd man out? You're the only person that feels that what's going on is wrong. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. I didn't know how many promises were in the Bible. I want to say it's around 3,000 promises that are in the Bible. I may be wrong. I think that's a little bit low, but I think it's just right around 3,000 something uh, and some change right in there. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious, you can underline that word again, promises. God called us into moral excellence and glory. He done all this by these promises in which he has given us. One of the, uh, you can, I guess, debate uh, upon your own personal feelings what the greatest promise that God give you is. You can say that it's the promise that his son's coming back. You can say it's the promise that if he went to prepare, that he's going to prepare a place for you. You can say it's the promise that he's never going to leave you nor forsake you. There's tons of promises that we can look at and that we can preach upon tonight that are great, uh, that are exceedingly great and precious promises. Amen? Amen. One of the greatest promises that it was that he give you was this word. That's all of them. That is precious. Just, just, just this word. But knowing that we can have a better understanding of these and that no matter how, how uh, uh, literate or how educated or how uh, 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 smart it is that we are, every single person can comprehend every word that is in there. That's a great promise. And that promise is the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. There's nothing good in the world. Nothing good's coming from the world. We have escaped corruption. We have done this by one of these great and precious promises. God has took us in. Strangers on the street, dirty and ragged, 
hungry, needing fed, and he opened the door and allowed us to come in. How many of us would do that for others? This kind of weather, I'd hope you'd at least think about it. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Lust, covetousness, these things kind of go hand in hand. They're best friends. And oftentimes they're our own best friends. It is the desire to have things that, that others have. Uh, these are things that uh, become idols into us, become little, uh, little g-gods that we worship. But these are all corruptible things that are in the world because uh, every possession in which you own other than your salvation is corruptible. People can take them from you. Everything that you own, I can take it away from you. I can catch you when you're gone. I can catch you when you're asleep. You may have everything you have in the bank and safety deposit box. Well, hey, I can take those too. You have insurance, Amen. We all pay this stuff. Stay with me, guys. Do we not all have insurance on most of our things? And if somebody takes it, we can get it back? Ain't it nice to know that you have one thing that not no person can take away from you? That nobody's going to get their hands on? That nobody is going to be able to, to tear away from you? There is one thing in which you own that cannot be taken away. Amen. And it is that one thing that you own that takes away everything else that is in you. Amen. That one thing that wipes your slate clean, that, that, that cleans you from the inside out, that one thing that, that, that allows you to be able to, 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 to come uh, in the presence of God, whether it be by prayer or just into the church or whatever it may be. But it says, and beside this, giving all diligence. Diligence. Somebody define diligence for me. No, Seriously. I'm asking. Somebody define diligence. We've all heard the phrase, give your due diligence, right? D what does it mean? Somebody tell me. You're wanting to speak, go ahead and do it. Yes. Thoroughly, right? I, I got, you guys have to say it so I'll make sure you know what we're talking about. Okay, let's read it that way. And beside this, giving all, how would we say? And beside this, uh, uh, wholeheartedly adding to your faith virtue. Wholeheartedly. Does God not also command in his word that whatever we do, we do it wholeheartedly? That we don't do it just for the appearance of, of men, whether it be fasting or whatever it is that we may have had this morning. But it says to do it wholeheartedly, to give everything that you have. I'm here to tell you that each and every time that you stand and teach, or whether you sit and teach, whether you stand, whether, you, uh, or whether you're called it to, to whatever it is that you do, when you sing, when you play, whenever, everything that you do for God, there should be a little piece of you left there. You should do it wholeheartedly. You should give everything, everything that, that is in you that you have, you should pour out to that one cause. Amen. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Not only are we to have faith, if we are going to, to, to be heirs of the kingdom, we have to have faith. Amen? And besides from that, there's commandment given here that other than just that faith, I want you to have moral excellence. And after you add that moral excellence, hey, I want you to have knowledge. I want you to have knowledge of me, of my commandments, of my statutes, of my judgments. I want you to have knowledge of each and everything about me. That is what God is saying. I want you to have all of this. And after you start learning a little bit, I want you to add self-control. How many of us have that? You're talking to somebody that has a short fuse, somebody that has a temper, and it don't take much for me to lose my self-control. But on top of these things, God is saying, I want you to have moral excellence. I want you to have faith. I want you to have knowledge. And I want you to have self-control. 
How many of us have self-control? All the time. That means when you're by yourself, around back, you're working on your lawnmower because it's only three years old and for some reason it never seems to work and everything that, in your mind, everything that you have just falls to crap as soon as you get it. And when all this is happening and you're down there and you're knowing that you're just like six months outside of warranty and your lawnmower is already tore up, do you have self-control? I did not have self-control yesterday. I promise. I did not. And it's not only that, but when you've had a rough day and you, all you want to do is you just want to, uh, you, you're in a hurry because it's Wednesday evening, you've had a long day at work and you've got to go out and you've got to get some fast food and you go up and you order it and lo and behold, they cannot get it right. Do you have self-control? What about when you go to Walmart and you pay with a hundred and they give you change for a twenty? Do you have self-control? Hey, there ain't none of you church family there. It's okay to break down just a little bit. Do you have self-control all the time? That don't mean when people's present because God's always present. He's saying, I want you to have faith. I want you to have moral excellence. I want you to have knowledge, a working-based knowledge of me. I want you to have self-control. And after you have self-control, I want you to have endurance. My Bible says patience. Patience means endurance. It's easier if we say endurance, right? Because ain't none of us patient. But we can say that we can endure. We can endure hardships, can't we? Why, well, yes, preacher, we can, we can endure hardships. We can endure trials. We can do all these things. But are you patient through them? No. It's one and the same. But after you have self-control, I want you to have endurance. I want you to endure all these things. Because having self-control means at some point you are cramming stuff down in a bottle and it ain't going to be long until that bottle's full and everything's going to come out. God don't want that to happen. He wants you to have endurance. When your bottle gets full, replace it with another one. Better yet, put it in the box that was on the bulletin. Amen? Add to your endurance godliness. But if we have godliness, we're arrogant, ain't we? We are self-righteous. We are more holy than thou. We are, uh, we're, 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 we're uh, let's see, what, what is it that we call each other when we have godliness? What, what we've covered self-righteous. We've covered more holy than thou. Uh, we, uh, we're hypocrites. Uh, what, what else are we, church? What else do you call each other? Come on now. What else are we? There's tons of things that we call each other for godliness, amen? Get real with me here. Let's just be honest. Let's just, just get everything out in the open. Let's just be honest. When someone displays godliness, do we take kindly to it? Sometimes we get offended, don't we? I do. I'm no different than you guys. I can get offended too. If somebody's acting real godly, it makes me feel bad. And when stuff makes me feel bad, I got to beat you down. That's just the way the world works. Amen. Add to your endurance godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And after we start displaying all this godliness, we are going to need the brotherly kindness because then these, all these harsh words that we just talked about, we can no longer say. When we find our brothers and sisters in need, when there's something going on, rather than saying, well, you know, they, they reap what they sow, they deserve it. Is that brotherly kindness? No. Is brotherly kindness not forgetting what uh, things that they may or may not have done? I can go through without any. You ain't got to see me. I can still read up here. It don't matter what things that they may or may not have done in the past. You, you endure with them through your patience and you display brotherly kindness. You ever been in need? And you, those times when you're in need, you were so happy just to see somebody pull up. You ever been sitting on the side of the road with a flat tire? How many people do you see just drive right on by you? But then that one person stops, and what do you say? Thank God. Is that not really what we, what, what we say? That's exactly what we say. We say, thank God. 
Some kind soul stopped. Uh, our hot water, he hot water heater went out a few weeks ago. And I went to get it, and I had it strapped down there on the back of the truck. And I got noticed I was going up the mountain. I got to rocking. I thought I better slow down. I ain't nowhere for me to pull over in this construction zone. I finally got up there by the sawmill with a spot where I could get over, and the guy behind me seen it was rocking. And he pulled in there with me. He said, "Brother, do you need some help?" And I was thinking, "You mean there's still people like you in the world? There's still people that would stop and ask you if you need help." That brotherly kindness, it's those little acts. It is those little acts that make you want to say, Brother, God bless you. Thank you so much for stopping. You didn't have to. You could have kept trucking right on by me. Add to godliness brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. What is charity? Love and action. Love and action. A fervent, a, a, a fiery, a, 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 a passionate love. Not just for someone, but for everybody, for everything, charity. I, after we, after we kind of get this brotherly kindness thing get, get going down path, it's going to get to be a habit for us. And then it becomes love, because then it becomes when you see somebody in need, you have to stop. You want to stop. You want to stop just to be able to help somebody else, because somebody at some point extended their hand out to you. Otherwise, how many bad names have you called people that kept driving past you? Seriously. How many times have you, have you uh, 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 called people all sorts of names just because they're too busy to help you out? And how many times are you that person that's just driving on by that says, well, I know so-and-so may need some help this weekend, but man, I don't really want to. I've had a long week. I'm tired. I ain't got to do this. It's me, 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 me. I, I want to do this. I want to do that. Is that what, what you would want from others? I don't know why I ever call him. Every time I call him, he's got something else to do. I don't know why I wasted my breath asking that fella for help. That can be us. Add to brotherly kindness, charity. And if these things be in you and abound, not only if they're in there to some people, but if they abound, if they are flowing out of you like a fountain, they make ye, they make you that ye shall neither, neither be barren nor unfruitful. Did God call us to produce fruits or to be unfruitful? Produce fruits. Amen. Amen. If you can't do these things right here, can you be fruitful? But it says, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. First and foremost, you have to have knowledge in Him because if you want to be godly, if you want to have God, uh, 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 be, uh, if you want to have godliness, you have to know what God is like. Amen? So you have to have the knowledge. You cannot jump and do one before the other. Peter gives a great working order of how you need these things. Nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. That being said... How many of us are spiritually blind this evening and cannot see that Jesus is soon making his return? How many of us cannot see that there's going to be many of our friends and loved ones that's going to be left here to endure the wrath of God? Do you think they're going to have patience? Do you think that they would be displaying brotherly kindness to you if they knew that you could have saved them from that? I'm not saying that you're going to do the saving. I'm just going to say that you can introduce them to the one that is. Where is our brotherly kindness? Has anybody read Revelations and knows what's going to be going on? There's going to be a lot of terrible, horrible things that goes on during that seven-year time period, and it is up to us to produce fruits. You know what our fruits can be? Our friends and loved ones. Wherefore the rather, brethren... Let me back up. But he that lacketh these things is mine and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten... That he, 
that he was purged from his old sins. Have you forgotten what you were saved from? Have you forgotten that at some point you was on the other side? Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. You shall never fail. You shall never uh, 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 not be able to do what God has set forth for you to do. Amen? For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. What is our entrance to the kingdom? Amen. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Jesus is that gate. Jesus is the only way that we enter in. God provided that interest for you and I by sending his son to do the things that we talked about earlier, to be born of a virgin, to, to live here, to die, to be crucified on the cross, to be buried in the ground, and to rise again on the third and appointed day. That is God's plan. That is how he made the gate for you and I. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, we talked a lot this morning about the, the ritualism and the symbolicness of things that we do in, in a church house. This is the tail end of that, and all these things is what must be done in the church house. There must be the, 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 the virtue, the knowledge, the patience, the, 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 the temperance, the godliness, the charity. All these things must be present in order to have a church. Amen? Amen. Otherwise, we're just a bunch of people. Amen? Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence, wholeheartedness. Give it your all, everything that you have, to make your calling and election sure. Are you doing everything that you can do to make sure that you're doing all that God wants you to do? Or are we content and satisfied? That's the, that's the kicker of the, of the, the whole thing. It says, uh, 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 diligently make your election and your calling sure. I don't mean make sure you're doing a good job. It makes sure that you're doing everything that God wants you to do. Make sure you're not sitting down on the job. Amen? I know you are all seating, seated, but it don't mean you're sitting down on the job. Let us stand together this evening.